Good evening, everyone. Uh, we'll be uh, starting the session very shortly. Just allow us a few more minutes, maybe uh, two to three minutes. We're just waiting on a uh, few people to join the session. proteins in India in the series of the Ajadi Ka Amrit Mohatsap celebrating 75 years of India's independence. Before I start, I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to all my teams, my speakers and the lovely audience who have helped to make this event come together successful. And now I hand it over to Pritha ma'am to give us the brief introduction about the city and set the context of the webinar. Over to you ma'am. Okay. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, yeah. I welcome you all, uh, you know, to participate in this session that we have organized for you today um, on smart routines. So before we move on with the session, uh, here's a brief presentation um, that I would want to give you and apprise you about Fixie, what we are, who we are, and what we do. So um, good evening again. Uh, I'm Preeta Tripathi. I'm the Deputy General Manager Training at Fixie. 
So I'll quickly share my screen with you. I hope my screen is visible to everyone. Is it visible? OK, so food industry capacity and skill initiative, which is widely known as the Food Processing Sector Skill Council, is a not for profit organization working to create skilled manpower for the food processing industry. We are promoted by the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, that is FICI, with the support by National Skill Development Corporation, NSDC, and the Ministry of Food Processing Industries, that's MOFPI. Uh, there is a governing council that governs the work that we do and uh, it comprises of many government and from the industry. As you can have a look on your screens in front of you, it is currently headed by Mr. Akshay Bekter, who is the chairman and managing director at Kramika Foods Limited. We also have on board the CEO uh, of Food Safety and Standards Authority of India. We have um, the uh, representations from CSIR, uh, CFTRI, FICI, ITC, NSDC, uh, Ministry of Processing, uh, Food Processing Industries, uh, and you know the list of uh, industries, food industries that we have on board and on our council. They keep on shuffling as per uh, the guidelines. So uh, these are some of the uh, industries that are our core members and who are associated with us. Uh, we are also into, uh, we have entered into MOUs with uh, many organizations. We have an existing MOU with FSSCI where we collaborate on uh, various uh, technological and training platforms. We are um, doing the first tech trainings for FSSCI. Uh, we are also into collaboration with the premier educational institutes that are, you know, the premier institutes in food processing like the NIFTEM, CFTRI, IIFPT, IGNU and Lady Irvin College. And we have entered uh, in an MOU with the Food Processing Skills Canada, that is a Secretary Skill Council uh, for Food Processing in Canada. And uh, we're happy to inform you that we'll be coming up and launching many um, international level courses for food science, uh, for food safety and hygiene in the coming few weeks. So uh, please uh, you know, visit our portal and be updated of what's happening. So uh, let's talk about what are the functions of FICSI, what do we do? So it is an industry-led uh, organization and we are mandated to create skill manpower for the food processing industries. So some of the uh, services that we do and we provide is the development of standards, content and curriculum. And we have already developed 49 NSQF that are aligned with the qualification packs. We are also responsible for uh, conducting the assessment and certification of the trained candidates. Candidates. We uh, participate in the setting up of affiliation and accreditation of the training centers. We plan and facilitate the execution of the training of trainers of the TOT and the TOAs, that is training of assessor programs. And we work very closely with the policy makers to strategize different initiatives that are required for skilling. These are some of the services uh, broadly, which uh, you can have a look on your screens. We are providing trainings in the food safety and hygiene scene. Um, so we are authorized uh, training provider of FSSA. Uh, little less, we have trained close to 45,000 uh, food handlers uh, through the uh, FOSTEC program on food safety and hygiene as per the Schedule 4 regulations of FSSAI. We have an existing job portal which is very unique in a way that uh, this job portal is specific for the food industry and I urge all the students here who are joining us today to make sure you know that you log into our portal and create your profile. We have many companies who are our member and they look up you know they look up for candidates and freshers from the food industry on a very regular basis. Uh, we also have a learning management system that is a e-learning system wherein we have approximately 40 courses which are self-paced. You can um, you know, create your login IDs and avail all the courses, uh, whatever you desire. And another thing that uh, we do which is very interesting is the uh, National Apprenticeship Promotion Scheme. So for students, this is another thing for people, you know, students who are currently in their, <coughs> excuse me, final year of their bachelor's or master's degree. 
they can avail this service and they can provide uh, they can find apprentice opportunities across the food industry across the country so what we will be doing is you know um, we will be sharing the link of our website uh, specific to these uh, services that we provide then please make sure you know that you visit the sites and create your login and try to avail the services all the services they are free and you can definitely you know this will this is going to help you out in the future so that's all uh, from me uh, there are a few pointers you know that i would like to uh, mention to all the participants here firstly uh, i hear many people they are asking about uh, you know when are we going to receive these certificates or is the link available where we can see the video once the session is over firstly we are streaming this um, session live on youtube and once uh, the session ends the youtube video will be saved and it will be available on our handle on the fixie channel will be we, we have already shared the link on the chat window here the second information is for all the participants who are here today to um, join uh, and attend this session uh, at the end of the session we will be needing you when we say that you know we want your email ids please make sure that you um, you know uh, feed in your name and email id in the chat box when we open it for chat and we will be providing you a feedback link um, on uh, submitting that link uh, we will be providing you a certificate of participation for this webinar i think that's all from my side i hope you know it's going to be a very uh, interactive and uh, interesting session something you know that all of you are looking eagerly forward to uh, i'll hand it over to uh, rohit to um, go ahead with the uh, session thank you everyone thank you very much ma'am for introducing about the fixi and now i would like to introduce our speakers and uh, so today we have mr varun desh pandey with us i welcome to you sir on the webinar on the future of the smart proteins uh, mr varun desh pandey is a managing director at the good food institution india and he's completed his chemical and biomedical engineering completed he completed his chemical and biomedical engineering from kanji mellon university and whole food system starting right here in india so i welcome you sir thank you for being agreeing to be the part of this webinar and now i hand it over to you sir Hello everyone a warm welcome thank you for joining us for this session because of some technical difficulties Varun is unable to join this session we were trying to get him join um, the call but i'm very happy to take you through our today's session uh, and our presentation so let's get started really quickly with that you are able to see uh, my screen just, just just a moment shadul i would prefer that you know people know who you are before you take the yeah. uh, center stage so uh, rohit if you can just give a yeah. brief uh, about shadul before he starts uh, the presentation thank you so here i welcome to you also mr shadul dhabir and he is presently working as innovation specialist at uh, at good food institution and work on accelerate the early stage innovation ecosystem for the smart protein sector and enable the gfi teams of the expert in shaping the future of the food effectively and and sustainably 
and he is the young indian fellow from the ashoka university and has uh, completed his bachelor in the food technology and management from the niftam mufti government of india and he has spent time as a researcher at uh, rutgers university usa and the university of saskatchewan canada and shardul loves traveling and entrepreneurship and has been a jagrati uh, yatri in the past so a very warm welcome to you mr shardul and uh, i hand it over to you yes just a moment i think i've just done something shardul i have given the uh, rights of switching on the camera and uh, unmuting the mic to varun let's see if he is able to speak uh, varun can you please unmute yourself and switch on your video if you are able to let's see if this works right yeah i mean i can speak but i'm sure i i, I don't think you'll be able to see me as one of the speakers yes i think this works so i think if shardul can you know uh, present the slides and varun can talk i think even we can do that is it doable yeah sure i mean i think in terms of the flow i think shardul can take it on with no worries i can be here for q and a oh varun hello yeah you can't hear me you i think yeah 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 ahead. i can i can i can hear you now yes i can hear you okay, so maybe I, I think we should have Shardul just start the presentation instead of uh, waiting more time. It would be better if he just gets moving. If we don't mind, yeah. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so I'll get started with the presentation. Thank you, Pratha and the Fixi team for introduce for the introduction. Uh, are you able to see my screen and the presentation? It's just getting loaded, uh, Shardul. Yeah, it's it's come it's come up. Yeah. Perfect. That's great. Come. Let me just go to the home screen. Let's get started. Thank you all for joining us and uh, sorry for the technical glitches, uh, but quite excited to present today's session, right? Very exciting as the topic such as smart routine is the next big thing. And we are certainly looking to convey why is it the next big thing in our country and why is it leading the future of food technology globally and also we hope for India soon. So this is a quick agenda. We'll understand what is the need for smart protein products and the growth of the smart protein sector in our country and globally. We'll understand the three key modalities right plant based fermentation derived and cultivated meat eggs and dairy and seafood how do we create those what are the production platforms etc what is the science and technology behind it we'll understand what are the key investments that are fueling this category and what is the market size and potential globally and in the asia region and we'll also try to understand who are the consumers for these products ultimately right is it flexitarians vegetarians is it uh, hardcore non vegetarians etc and we'll also try to understand how we can help the smart protein startups that are currently existing in our country and then we'll focus on some high impact areas as that gf india focuses on to build this sector for our country and also globally so really quickly I'm, i'll cover some of the portion that varun was supposed to present um you all know right like uh, food security is a global uh, insecurity is a global problem and uh, a huge amount of people uh, you know present globally are currently food insecure at the same time we are looking to close a big gap between what we are currently producing in terms of food versus what we'll need to produce in 2050 in fact a gap of almost 56 60% that is the total calorie gap that we are looking to bridge which means that we have to really account for 10 billion people and feeding them by 2050 and out of them every sixth person would be indian right um so that's a huge statistic in itself that we need to think about when we think about food processing and food technology for our country and also for the globe now the land that we use to grow this food right it's quite limited already on earth surface not all the land that is habitable uh, you know um, uh, is being used properly and the ones that is being used you know only 50% of the total land that is available can be used for agriculture out of which currently 77% of the land is being used to grow food and feed livestock and you know graze livestock etc etc and then only 23% of the land is actually used to grow crops that is being fed to people so you see how small that number is and within that you know obviously a lot of focus is on growing protein meat eggs and dairy so that's a major uh, focus area as well and what are we really looking at here in terms of a system right uh, food coming as protein from animals is an inefficient system fundamentally because as you can see 8 calories go in and one calorie comes out which is a conversion of 13% in case of a chicken which is one of the most optimal animals for getting our meat and protein out and then 11 calorie go in goes in one calorie comes out 
that is nine percent conversion, thirty four calories going in, one calorie coming out. That is three percent converted for cow. So as you can see, it's inherently inefficient cycling all of these calories uh, and our protein needs through animals, and it's equivalent to a wastage of eighty seven to ninety seven percent of food in the production system itself. So we are usually talking about food wastage, right? Like we grow hundred uh, uh, grams of food, thirty. Grams of food is usually wasted, 30 to 40 grams. That's the statistic that we all know and study as food technologists and allied, allied industry professionals. But we don't think about the kind of food that is currently being wasted in the production itself, which is a very key point to focus, which our sector kind of focuses on. Uh, and to feed 10 billion people by 2050, we have to think about sustainable, efficient and safe methods. And current system does not really offer that, right? Because uh, industrialized animal agriculture and cycling calories through animals is contributing a lot to environment uh, through carbon emissions, methane emissions. And it's one of the top two to three most significant contributors to pressing problems like land use, water use, biodiversity loss, uh, coral reef loss in case of seafood, uh, ocean and, you know, Fish, overfishing in oceans, all of that. At the same time, 15% almost of the greenhouse gas emissions, which is more than all the transportation combined. You know, we complain about uh, a lot of emissions from transportation in Mumbai, Delhi. And when you combine all of that for India, when you combine that all for all the countries present, Compared to that, there's more contribution from animal agriculture to greenhouse gases. We talked about the inefficiency in cycling those calories, like, you know, um, and at the same time, there's 77% of land, agricultural land, that is currently being used to get only one third of our global protein supply, as we discussed. At the same time, antibiotic that are currently being fed to animals, right? Whether it's um, chicken, et cetera, that also raises some concerns around safety of it throughout the value chain. So those are quite important concerns to keep in mind. And uh, multiple reports, including from the UN, et cetera, have indicated that uh, how we feed people uh, using animal protein and their protein needs and unsustainable agriculture in in intensification are one of the are two of the most likely drivers for the next pandemic. And we are living amidst the pandemic currently, which is probably zoonotic. So it's quite relatable for all of us as well, I'm sure. And by 2050, 70% of the meat demand is going to increase, right? And we saw all of these reasons People have known these reasons. Policymakers have been talking about it. Scientists and researchers have been talking about it for quite some time now, you know, multiple decades now. But still, the meat consumption keeps going up. And that just indicates that people want to eat more meat. And we need to get 70% more meat demand by 2050, which is a huge gap to fill. And as you can see on my screen, Asia is one of the big leaders in this uh, increase in uh, meat production at the same time, meat uh, consumption. So, as you can see, alternative meat currently is a very small percent of the total meat industry. And this is the total meat that we need to grow in the next 20 years, right? Uh, 30 years, right? To meet our meat demands by 2050. So you can see there's a huge scope for alternative sources of meat, eggs and dairy to kind of bridge the gap. So in especially in Southeast Asia, right? And in India, this is uh, a data point from um, Animal Production and Health Division at FAO. You can see that the Red indicators like India here, Southeast Asia, parts of China have been the have been driving the most poultry meat consumption for the past 30 years, and they will keep driving, uh, you know, the consumption of poultry in the next 20 years as well. So that's why it's a very important market to consider. We often think that India is a vegetarian country, but statistics and hard numbers say otherwise in terms of the consumption that is rapidly increasing, though our per capita consumption might be less. But the scope of where the demand is going to grow and how we're going to fulfill that is a crucial thing for all of us to think about as professionals involved in the food industry. So let's talk about the science and technology of this sector. What's our theory of change? It's quite simple, right? At GFI India, we want to make something that people want, right? And what do people really want? Um, they want to. So th that's where smart proteins really come in. So smart protein is also known as alternative protein globally. And it's basically about, we define smart protein products as viable alternatives to the consumption of animal derived meat, eggs and dairy products, because they perfectly replicate these products in every sense, right? Whether it's texture, smell, organoleptic properties, the gastronomic experience of consuming meat, eggs and dairy, the functionality of it. When you drink a glass of milk, you have a ball bearing effect in your mouth because of the fat, casein, et cetera, in the milk, right? So all of those things have to be basically looked at replicating to get a perfect alternative. And um, that's why they fall in three main categories of production. 
there's plant based proteins, there's fermentation, which is the second key vertical, and then there's cultivated meat. So, you know, plant based proteins, plant based ingredients are used for making plant based meat, eggs, and dairy. Fermentation derived ingredients are used to make fermentation derived meat, eggs, and dairy products. And then cell cultures are used to make cultivated meat, eggs, and dairy products. So let's see some of them at length, right? Plant-based meats are basically directly made from plants and, you know, ingredients like chickpea, pea protein, yellow pea, um, et cetera, et cetera, soya and coconut oil could be used for fat. So essentially using plant ingredients. If you think about it, what is really meat, right? It's just a bunch of chemicals put together through the process of evolution by nature, right? It's protein, fats, vitamins, minerals, water, put together in a format that we eat and consume. So next generation of plant-based meat options look, taste, and cook just like conventional meat and offer, in fact, some additions, which we cannot find from animals, like complex carbohydrates, fibers, which can be added in to make these products more healthier. And this is what this technology is affording us now. Uh, alternative protein technology. So you can see some examples here, like, uh, you know, the Beyond Burger, which is in the first uh, picture, which is made from yellow pea protein. It emits 89% less greenhouse gases, uses 99% less water to be made. Same thing for plant-based eggs, which are made from moong bean. And India is one of the largest producers of moong bean, for example, uses 98% less water, 83% less land, 93% less CO2. And recently, 80 million egg equivalents from Eat Just, which is a company which makes plant-based eggs, were sold globally. Similarly, for dairy, there are different options to consider, right? Pea protein, coconut, almonds, um, uh, tapioca. I've seen uh, people make cheeses which replicate uh, uh, dairy cheese from basically cauliflower as well. So a lot of ingredients from plants to explore and play along with. So this is the value chain for plant-based uh, products, right? Largely, you're trying to, you go all the way to the crops first because are these crops optimized? Probably not, right? For the past many decades, we've been focusing on only a few crops, wheat, rice, uh, corn, soy. But what about a lot of pulses, millets, indigenous crops um, that are specific to India? We haven't been really doing a lot of R&D on that. So how do we firstly optimize the crop? That's where it all starts. And then obviously, once you get the raw material, uh, you know, getting the best isolates, concentrates, understanding what are the most efficient methods of extracting these are the kind of steps which are in the raw material optimization, a part of the value chain. And then there's end product or composition and process optimization, where a lot of food technologists and food industry people also come in because you have to replicate the new product development, considering that, OK, what are you trying to really replicate towards the end, right? Is the taste, texture, smell, and you have to consider how those ingredients play along, how those different processes scale up uh, and how do you really manufacture this? For example, currently extrusion is the technology that most people use, uh, specifying high moisture extrusion in particular, right? But, which India does not have many high moisture extruders, but that is a key technology that is currently being used to texturize these proteins and then get that end product that you can see here in a photo as well. Um, so that's what we are talking about when we are talking about the value chain of plant-based proteins. Here's an example that I wanted to cover, right? Like people often ask me, what are the key ingredients that we are focusing on? And it depends on multiple, com uh, a combination of multiple factors, right? Firstly, what is the concentration of protein in the crop? Now, jackfruit is a great ingredient, but there's not enough protein in it, for example, right? Whereas soy has great amount of protein in it. So you can see here, what is dark green means it's a excellent benchmark score, right? And we have given you some idea of what that really means. Now you'll consider all of these different ingredients and different factors, like what is the concentration? What is the speedy cast score? You know, how, how, how much is it digestible in your body? What is the allergenicity risk, which is usually a concern with soy, um, you know, or gluten, for example, in wheat? Uh, what is its commercial stage? Okay, great. An entrepreneur thinks I want to work with fava bean, but does the value chain for that really exist in our country? Are there suppliers for it? Are there uh, people who are putting up extraction and isolation facilities for it? Am I going to get a consistent supply at a commercial level? Level, those are important considerations as well. Uh, then you have to think about flavor, you have to think about functionality, uh, because you know the same chickpea protein that you get might be used in a dairy application, might be used in a meat application, might be used in a seafood application, or might be used in an egg application. But they perform differently in all of those different applications within dairy. Think about it, right? There's cheese, there's milk, there is paneer, there are different varieties of cheese, there's chas. Are you trying to replicate or use a specific 
property from a protein to replicate that functionality is key consideration as well. And obviously, ultimately, any commercial thing has to do a lot with cost, and you have to account for that as well while you're trying to do. So like I said, only a few crops like soy, pea, wheat are currently cost competitive, and rest a lot of them are still being researched and focused on in terms of their cost competitiveness. And globally, how much these crops are growing is also quite important to keep in mind. And then obviously, the ingredient optimization and end product formulation and manufacturing comes in. Now, second, this is one modality of production of alternative or smart proteins, right? The second one is fermentation. Uh, fermentation basically includes cultivation of any microbial species uh, or either a whole cell biomass of a value of a, or a valuable fraction that is coming from that whole cell biomass. And this platform has been well established. All of us as food technologists study fermentation, but we study it probably for uh, alcoholic beverages or maybe traditional fermentation. We don't take it a step further, but a lot of base knowledge and R&D still exists in our country from the biotech side, from the pharma side. And that's why we see India uh, contributing a lot to the fermentation derived meat, eggs and dairy products. This is a well established platform per se, but the specific application to replicate meat, eggs and dairy is quite new as an application area. We've been using you know, it for, uh, so this is a great example. 90% of the modern cheese production that currently uses fermentation derived uh, you know, enzymes to basically use uh, Rene enzymes rather than extracts from calf stomachs. So, you know, animals were part of the value chain for quite some time, right, for decades. But we have found applications, whether it's insulin, whether it's renate. Uh, we have been finding alternative applications which are more cost effective. And there's demonstrated history of food industry and other pharma and biotech industries uh, uh, finding these cost effective applications as well. So that's what we want to focus on when we are trying to talk about this sector. So there are three key areas. There's traditional fermentation, there's biomass fermentation, like I said, and then there's precision fermentation, right? And in either of these cases, as you can see some of the applications here, there's, there are some overlaps between them uh, and there are some examples. So, you know, tempeh, cheese, yogurt, alcoholic beverages are all part of traditional fermentation. But what we are now looking at is, uh, for example, precision fermentation derived flavorings, pigments, enzymes that could be used to create this, or we can just ferment the biomass and end product could be uh, your texturized kind of a product which replicates the sensory properties of meat, for example. Here are some uh, products that you can see made from fermentation derived protein, right? And they look quite a lot like meat. And globally, many companies have been innovating in this. Now, what is cultivated meat really is the third key production modality. And basically, we are taking cells out of animals. The animal does not die in the process. And then we are putting those cells, um, you know, uh, in, in basically a bioreactor, providing it some growth media. And then those cells grow and we get a specific end um, organ or a tissue that we want. For example, a wing, uh, it could be also a 3D structure. If you're in India, not a lot of people eat ste steaks or other such 3D printed structures, but you can also get that by using scaffolds. So I'll, I'll quickly explain that value chain to you as well. We basically take a cell out of an animal. It could be any of the species. It could be for seafood. Uh, multiple species exist, right? So many tons of fish exist. So you take a cell line, which is stable. Uh, you put it in a starter culture, and then those cells basically proliferate, right? And that cell culture media. And basically what then happens is there's tissue perfusion, which is like a second stage where you can think about it, simply speaking of cells coming together and they all come together on a scaffold, which can be edible. So a lot of innovation is happening there. You can use a lot of fungi sources to make those scaffolds. And then those final product would look something like this. And uh, you'll need a bioreactor basically for all of this to happen, which is quite similar to a fermentation kind of a brewery, uh, kind of an image where you can think about beer being fermented in a kind of big fermentation tank, the process at scale looks very, very similar. And uh, there are multiple companies now in this. And, you know, a few years ago, this all sounded uh, like far-fetched technology. But the good thing is recently in 2020, uh, you know, Singapore became the first country to allow the sell, uh, selling of these products to consumers directly. So now you can go to Singapore, order it on your app and get a uh, cult you know, cultivated meat delivered to your home. So that's where the progress has been made in the past uh, six years that the industry has been growing. It started with few incumbents, uh, first early movers, and now multiple companies are working on this. A couple of them are from in India as well, like Clear Meat um, and MyoWorks. So I want to leave you with these three key production modalities. These are not independent, right? These are all kind of working with each other. And, you know, there's a fully plant based on one side of the spectrum. There's fully cultivated on the other side of the spectrum. And then, you know, there'll be a combination. So, for example, you can get a base material from plants and then you can use fats made by the process of uh, 
fermentation or cultivated uh, kind of technology, derived technology, and then you can mix those both. So you solve the problem of mouthfeel, which is usually animal fat is very difficult to replicate in plant-based uh, sources, right? Because that's unique to animals. So there could be a lot of hybrid products coming along the way as well. Here's an example of Impossible Burger, which uses, for example, uh, soy hemoglobin obtained from soy roots to replicate the bloody kind of metallic taste and uh, appearance that is usually found in the hemoglobin of animals, right? Um, so that's one great application as well. Uh, and innovation can come in many ways in this spectrum across the three key production modalities. And we see that there's a lot of uh, impact on environment that these products would have, right? Uh, a lot of our studies, which are life cycle assessment studies from GFI and uh, CE Delft, which is a, a leading university in the Netherlands, uh, looking at life cycle assessment recently, pointed out some of this data. And you can see in terms of land use, water use, air pollution, uh, you know, toxic chemicals being uh, let in the in the environment, greenhouse gas emissions, plant-based meat is the most efficient, uh, then comes cultivated meat, and then there's conventional uh, chicken, pork, and beef, which is you know a multiple of 23x, 30x, 44x when it comes to land use compared to just 1x of plant-based meat. And in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, you can think of it as 1x, uh, you know, 7x, 12x, 41x. So it's it's quite quite efficient when you look at all of these parameters. And when you account for the context that I was earlier mentioning about greenhouse gas emissions, climate change, resource use, all of that. So quite exciting. So let's look at some investment data, right? Don't take our word for the sectors growing globally. Um, it's, it's been quite exciting uh, to note that multiple think tanks, uh, management consultancies, uh, investment banks have been putting out multiple reports, right? And they all think whether it's JP Morgan, AT Kearney, Credit Suisse, uh, you know, EY Parthenon, uh, Boston Consulting Group, they all think that the sectors of alternative protein markets going to reach somewhere between 100 to 370 billion dollars by 2035. So it looks quite exciting and promising. Uh, to be honest, and uh, this is validated by last year's data. We have our state of industry reports, which you can find on our website for each of the key modalities, which talks about a lot of this at length. But just to quickly cover, right, um, the investments have been growing 3x. Uh, so 2020 was a breakthrough year for the kind of investments that were made in this sector. Uh, and basically, they rose a lot, like 3x more investment in plant based compared to, uh, you know, 2019, uh, 2x in fermentation, 6x in cultivated. So that has been quite exciting. And what's more exciting is the APAC investments because Asia is leading this change in many ways and the APAC region is leading this change in many ways. Uh, you know, six, six, uh, six fold increase in the investments that went, went into plant-based meat, eggs and dairy in 2020. 7x uh, increase in investments that went into cultivated meat, eggs and dairy. So uh, basically these are some examples of the startups that have raised and companies that have raised the largest rounds. But I'll let you all look at the state of industry reports at length later on after this session as well. Um, and, you know, alternative protein development is highly underfunded. Now, I, I wanted to give you a different perspective as well. We're seeing all of this investment coming in, but when you compare it with all the other solutions that can make, uh, you know, earth, climate, uh, human health uh, better, when you compare it with solar, wind, biomass, biofuels, hydro, which are things you might have usually related with sustainability, the kind of investment that goes into meat, uh, alternative meat is very, very small, right? Very, very small. It's about 1 billion. So just to give you a perspective of what kind of money goes into other sectors and how much room there is for global R&D investment, specifically talking about R&D in this sector. And I wanted to give you some examples of um, the global landscape, right? Some of the countries have been really leading the change in the committed to a national level coordinator for cultivated meat promotion, right? And the Innovation Authority has been funding a lot of projects in this area. I was talking about Singapore earlier where, you know, it became the first cultivated meat regulatory approval country uh, in December 2020. And, uh, you know, by 30 by 30, they have included alternative protein as a key focus area for their vision of growing food uh, and, you know, exporting to other countries as well. The FDA and USDA are jointly regulating cultivated meat and, you know, already hundreds of plant-based meat, eggs and dairy companies are selling their products across these countries as well, uh, including a lot of protein supercluster, just like India, Canada has a lot of production of protein rich crops, right? So they have put in protein superclusters, they're supporting academia, industry, significant government funding, for example, the 100 million federal investment in plant protein processing that recently happened are notable examples. And we are trying to do a lot of this to build this ecosystem in India as well. So now coming to my part of the session, uh, really quickly. 
and just taking a time of the uh, note of the session as well. So India has many national dishes, right? Now we saw uh, a few examples of hamburgers and other fillets and steaks shown in the previous examples, but that's not the context in India. We don't eat those products, right? We are not eating hamburgers uh, like Americans do. What do we eat? We eat keema, or it's a Bihar mutton curry, whether it's biryani meat or it's multiple snacking that we consume on a daily basis, right? There are multiple national to us, Piggy. Oops. Sorry, um, did I drop off? You are audible, Shardul. Can you, you hear are audible. Me? Yes, 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 you are audible. Got it. OK, got it. So I think there was a small internet lag. Let me reshare my deck. Am I still audible? Crystal. Perfect, great. Thank you so much, Pritha. So I was coming to the point that India is a very different country compared to the rest of the countries, right? Because of a unique food culture. We have multiple national dishes. So it's very, very important to think about the local product market fit, whether it's for entrepreneurs, it's for people involved in the food processing industries, whether it's for students or researchers thinking about making their careers in the sector. It's quite important to understand what are our specific advantages, what kind of crops we grow, what kind of protein rich crops do we grow, and what are the end applications of specific dishes that we are looking to replicate here in our country, right? That's very important. So plant-based options in India started with a version 1.0, right? Ingredients like soy, jackfruit, which were natural, lower fidelity mimics of meat-like structures. And this is an industry which started somewhere around 2016, 17, though you can consider soy chaap, a lot of things like soy nuggets have been in India for many, many years, but that didn't really uh, fulfill the demand of plant-based meat because, you know, this is veg protein category, basically. Uh, the meat eaters, who are the majority of uh, consumers consuming these products globally, are hardcore non-vegetarians and flexitarians, right? And these people want entire functionality of meat, the taste, the texture, as we've talked multiple times now. So that's where we are coming towards now in version 2.0 products, basically. The next generation of meat and dairy uh, alternatives made from plants, fermentation derived sources or cultivated sources that basically could be made into a keema, chicken nuggets. So these are some examples from startups that are leading this change in India. Good Dot, Blue Dry Foods, um, greenest, etc. And you can see shami kebabs, galotti kebabs, chicken nuggets, keema, uh, you know, uh, uh, small uh, mutton bites and different curry kits, which is very, very specific to India. That's the kind of innovation that we're seeing now. And this is just the landscape of some of the companies, few very exciting companies in here. For example, Blue Tri Foods that I was talking about, Imagine Meats, which is a uh, plant-based meat company uh, and being launched by Ritesh and Janilia Deshmukh. Uh, there's Naka Foods, Beef Veg Foods, which is looking to set up a high moisture, high moisture extrusion facility in our, in our country so that they can manufacture these products at scale and help other entrepreneurs manufacture that uh, because there's not enough uh, high moisture extruders in the country. So such startups which are focusing on um, these key white spaces are quite important. And then Good Dot has been uh, you know, the first incumbent and leading the plant-based meat category for three uh, plus years. And they've been exporting to multiple countries as well. Similarly, plant-based dairy companies, plant-based egg companies, ingredient companies, which are now working with millets, pulses, and other indigenous crops, and understanding how to best create the functionality. We saw that earlier, right, in the plant protein value chain. How do we focus on that? That's the kind of focus that some of these uh, startups that are focusing on plant-based meat, eggs, and dairy industry, and it's rapidly expanding, right? This is not exhaustive at all. Um, there are dozens of companies that are currently working on these products, and uh, you'll see these products in the market over the next year and a half or so. Some of this has been delayed because of the pandemic, but we can already find multiple products and order them online if you go to their websites. Now, the good thing is that uh, not just India and China and uh, other, other, other countries in the Southeast Asia region, this has been a global kind of a transformation of how people consume, right? And plant-based meat specifically in India, the acceptability, accept acceptability uh, you know, where consumers are agreeing with the fact that I would love to, uh, I, I would eat a plant-based meat substitute is quite high, 63%, right? And uh, this is basically in 2018, but it gets keeps getting replicated through a lot of studies. 2020, we saw similar numbers. In fact, the numbers are increasing uh, as we are doing more and more consumer testing. Uh, so who are these products really meant for? Who is the TG here? And uh, who are the consumers that are going to consume these products initially? Right. Ultimately, obviously, um, it depends on taste, price, and convenience. So the whole theory of change is um, it has to taste the same or better 
it has to cost the same or less and it has to be as easily and uh, conveniently available just like you can find meat eggs and dairy products currently in the market and unless you get there you're not going to hit mass uh, and you know late majority early majority kind of adoption for these products so currently all of the startups are trying to innovate for the early adopter cohort which is you know uh, uh, upwardly mobile people like me and a lot of people in audience today right uh, in the age groups of 25 to 34 35 to 44 people with a bachelor's or a master's degree or a higher education degree people who have more than 50000 uh, you know INR monthly income, people living in large metro cities, uh, tier one towns who eat out, who are omnivores more importantly, right? They eat non-vegetarian food. So why would a vegan person or a vegetarian person want to eat something which tastes like meat, eggs and dairy, right? If they're not used to eating them. Um, the smell, like I'll give you an example. My mom would never really eat plant-based meat because she's a lifelong vegetarian. So you're focusing on hardcore non-vegetarians and flexitarians and omnivores who for multi and maybe in, in our country, people like guilty non-vegetarians, right? Who eat out, but for X, Y, Z reasons, whether it's social reasons, cultural reasons, they're not able to eat uh, meat products and they are looking for a healthier, sustainable uh, alternative to meat and want to shift to that. that. That's the kind of core cohort that we're focusing on uh, when we're talking about the early adopter cohort. OK, and then uh, oops. So yeah, so we talked about price, taste and convenience, but it's not just that, right? Even if you replicate that, there's an entire experience around it. And we did some um, you know, research around this and we found that people love the smell. People love, for example, the bones that come along with eating meat. Like, for example, if you're in Nagpur, where Saudi chicken is uh, Saudi chicken and mutton is very famous. I'm from Vidava. People love eating the bones. People love, you know, sucking the bones and the bone marrow out of it. People love uh, the smell of uh, the uh, the meat. So volatiles that are involved that gives those specific sensory experiences. It's an entire journey. So in our country, especially you're thinking about replicating a lot of that as well. So as a food technologist, when you're thinking about product development, new product development, you have to account for these gastronomic experiences as well. The layer of oil that floats along, the use of spices, etc., etc. So that also makes it relatively easier if you think about it, because you can use a lot of culinary applications to go along with the science and technology of food technology, marry them and get at superior products that are uh, catering to the local product market fit in our country. OK, so these are some cues for product development in our country. Uh, you know, you focus on meat eaters and develop products that are familiar in both formats and flavors. And you want to recreate some iconic products, right? Like, for example, if a startup really replicates biryani meat, um, and is able to uh, replicate all elements of it, then that's a game changer, really speaking, right? And our audience, the early adopter cohort is quite similar to the global, uh, you know, early adopter cohort, people living in other metro cities in other countries, which are upwardly mobile, educated, having some income, having some understanding of why sustainability matters, why we should consume these healthier products, et cetera, et cetera. And then poultry and mutton obviously have a higher appeal to start with because those are the most consumed categories in our country. But there's also a lot of room for seafood and, you know, plant-based seafood innovation as well because we consume we have a huge coastal line across uh, the three parts the three sides of india the two sides of india to be specific and then we can use a lot of that uh, habits and understanding to create plant-based seafood and be become a world leader in that as well and taste is most important thing and everything else after that like price uh, health uh, sustainability become the secondary th tertiary factors that matter. Taste is quite important. Price is quite important. It's a price sensitive country. But for the early adopter cohort, you know, price is not that big a deal as long as you're replicating taste and nutrition and the other aspects. So really quickly, coming to the last point of our presentation, understanding how the current smart protein landscape uh, really is, right? So uh, our focus is on creating Atma Nirbhar Bharat, right? And basically, uh, we want to build competitive talent pool for our country because we know that there are so many agriculture, food, biotech people involved. We have such a huge uh, crop biodiversity, lots of pulses, millets, other indigenous crops that we grow across our country, so many biodiverse zones. We are one of the major exporter and uh, producer of so many of these uh, agro commodities at the same time it's a big uh, industrial opportunity you know uh, mega food parks are coming we have so we, we have 
the largest manufacturers of vaccine in the world. So we have a strong pharma and biotech industry. So, you know, they have applications in cultivated and fermentation meat eggs in dairy, whereas a lot of this growth via our uh, food processing industries that is coming along is quite crucial for plant-based meat eggs in dairy as well. Now, taking a cue from this, and talent is the biggest bottleneck, right? Uh, almost 90% of the stakeholders that we are able to consult, whether it's MNCs, whether it's uh, food industries in India, whether it's small startups, they don't know who to hire to develop these products, right? That's why it's a very important engineering science, applied science kind of skill set that we're looking to develop, which is what I also want to talk about today with our India Smart Protein Innovation Challenge, which is our upcoming initiative. But let me talk about some of our other key initiatives as well. Uh, we have our GF Ideas India community. We have a flagship Smart Protein Summit. Uh, there's this India Smart Protein Innovation Challenge. Uh, we have a lot of resources, platform, uh, tools that we have created as a toolkit for people, entrepreneurs, investors, corporate professionals, scientists, academicians to join these platforms and innovate in. And then we have the mission for smart protein, which has five key pillars. So let's quickly see all of these, right? It's the GF Ideas India Innovation Community is the largest community of investors, entrepreneurs, sci-tech and non-sci-tech professionals, researchers uh, in our country who are all working towards a common mission of, you know, innovating in this area. We do multiple webinars. Thousands of people have attended these webinars and found value out of what we are trying to, uh, uh, you know, basically communicate towards them in terms in areas of innovation, business, science, technology, policy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it has been quite important for entrepreneurs to find their core team members, find, uh, you know, key connections with investors, et cetera, et cetera. And then we do our summit, right? And um, this is just a couple of people like Mr. Amitab Kant and Dr. Ron Malka speaking about the value of our summit. Last year, uh, we had Indra Nui as our chief guest, uh, keynote speaker. And at the same time, uh, Josh Tetrick from Eat Just. Uh, and you saw an example of plant-based egg from their company earlier. Uh, you remember those 80 million eggs sold? Uh, he was also one of our keynote speakers and multiple other um, you know, stakeholders and experts from scientific communities, government bodies, et cetera, were part of our summits. I, I uh, you know, request you to take a look at smartproteinsummit.com uh, to understand more about our summit and do participate. It's upcoming in November this year. So take a note of it from now. And then we have a bunch of resources. Like I was telling you about the investments earlier. So you can look at our state of industry reports. You can look at resources that we have for the uh, restaurant space. We have startup manuals, which are, you know, huge documents of 100 pages, 150 pages pages, laying out everything that an entrepreneur needs to know before starting a company in this area. We have databases, uh, for example, on multiple areas of value chains and, you know, other key stakeholders that are involved in this value chain stakeholders, equipment manufacturers, legal consultants, um, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, we also map all the companies that are there, you know, more than 1100 uh, companies in the plant-based meat eggs and dairy space are currently there globally right and we track a lot of them in our databases as well which will help a lot of you understand this space a little better and i was telling you about our toolkit a little bit so this is the kind of stakeholders we have you know in our smart protein ecosystem project for example uh, university research groups we we basically work with a lot of universities across india a lot of companies a lot of startups uh, and you know from all these universities students apply to our challenges and this India Smart Protein Innovation Challenge is one key piece of that. So this is a brief uh, kind of overview of what we are able to do in terms of entrepreneurship advisory, uh, in terms of support in understanding science uh, by releasing white papers, reports, conducting knowledge webinars, conducting networking webinars, facilitating the setting up of center of excellences across key universities, where we are currently speaking with NIFTIM, IFPT, ICT, CCMB, etc., and multiple other institutes, bio incubators across the country. And, uh, you know, we also focus on advising the government on key areas on this, on policy and regulatory as well. So that's like a whole approach that we have, which leads to this point, which is the mission for smart protein, which has five key pillars for us, right? Firstly, focus on indigenous crops, right? Our indigenous crops initiative wants to make sure that there's robust R&D and value chains created for these crops. And we saw the need for doing this earlier, right, in my slides. So this is quite important for pulses, millets, and other indigenous crops so that we can have a diversified supply of proteins, not just for India, but for the globe in terms of India becoming a hub of extracting these proteins and then supplying them not just in Southeast Asia, North America, um, Europe, but just globally, because that's where we have a lead. Then protein innovation hubs for the global south. We want to ensure that there are research and incubation centers so that, you know, there's Creating a product like this at lab is one thing, but then unless you have the ecosystem that goes along with it, researchers, food testing, food safety testing, texture analysis, which are not 
the kind of infrastructure usually easily available in our country. So focused on all protein research, new product development, we have to create center of excellences and protein innovation hubs. We, I already talked a little bit about why seafood is so important uh, for our country and smart seafood without sacrifice is another key area of our mission for smart protein. And then I was uh, earlier making this point about mega food parks, about how our biopharma and industrial fermentation and you know 3D printing, bioprinting kind of um, existing capacity can be really supplemented with a focus on all protein and uh, we can become leaders in this area globally. And then we also focus on smart protein corridors, right? Because we understand India processes five to seven percent of its food, right? And many other countries do a lot more. So the infrastructure, science, technology is much more evolved. So we want to, you know, create corridors between these leading countries like Singapore, Israel, US, Japan, Canada, Australia, USA, and then basically try to see how we can co-work and knowledge uh, exchange, technology exchange, best practices between entrepreneurs could be shared, etc. So that's our focus with the smart protein corridors front. So I'm um, really quickly coming on to my last couple of slides which talk about uh, the India Smart Protein Innovation Challenge. So this is a journey. 10th of September is the deadline. I request you all of you who are interested in contributing or making a career in this sector, whether you are an entrepreneur, whether you're a professional, whether you're a scientist, whether you're a student, whether you're a high school student, it's it's open for all almost and you can participate in one of the tracks and you can visit smartproteinchallenge.in to understand more about it. Uh, but it's basically a five month journey and, and every stage that you qualify, you get certifications, you get prizes. So it's quite exciting. And in the interest of time, I won't spend much time on this, but last year we were able to educate uh, you know, more than 1,000 people registered and 600 people got certified in phase one in the Smart Protein Digital Lab, which was anywhere, it, it was first of its kind, uh, you know, a course that was created by us to educate people in the fundamentals of these three key production modalities. And then that helps a lot of professionals from our backgrounds, from food industry, from biotech industry, from agriculture, even management graduates to understand how to basically contribute with their talents in the sector. And it's a creation of an entire industry. So you just don't need scientists and technologists. You need lawyers. You need people who understand marketing. You need everybody across the value chain to really come up and build this sector. So that has been quite exciting last year. And just to quickly run you through what we have planned for this year. Um, you know, we have uh, already a lot of uh, key partners in place sponsors in place. So Capri Global is our title sponsor, Alchem Foundation uh, and Network of Indian Cultural Enterprises is our key sponsor. We are organizing this challenge with CIA, Coat, IM Ahmedabad and multiple other incubators, accelerators, uh, you know, VC funds um, uh, and other stakeholders which are quite crucial like bio incubators on cultivated and fermentation side are already on board as partners and we look forward to receiving more applications from, you know, our ecosystem and attendees today. So there are two key tracks, one for students in SciTech and research oriented people, which is the ideation track, track one. And there is also a track two, which is for entrepreneurs. But before you get to phase two, all of you, no matter who you are, whether you're an 18 year old uh, student or whether you're a 60 year old uh, you know, entrepreneur who wants to now get from a legacy food business and enter into the smart protein industry, you're all welcome to join the first phase of the uh, challenge, India Smart Protein Innovation Challenge. Get educated, then find the relevant team members and then choose a track and then innovate in one of these three technology areas. And then there are obviously a lot of prizes, etc., which you can all take a look at our website, which is smartproteinchallenge.in. Again, just a reminder that the deadline is 10th of September. So we only have 15 days left and you know already hundreds of applicants have registered um, so please feel free to take a look and apply and with that I'll, I'll, I'll basically stop and open it up for the q a bit so that Varun can also take some questions on and you can visit gfi.org gfi.org.in we are a non-profit right so we work uh, with the with philosophy of open access sharing of all our knowledge and resources. So everything that we I currently mentioned in my presentation, you can find on our websites. And if you have any query, please feel free to write to us at india at jfi.org. Thank you. Thanks so much, Thanks so much. Uh, Shanti, for um, you know, such a informative session that we had. I am extremely sorry for uh, to everyone that we missed uh, on hearing from Varun. Um, obviously, you know, in today's day and time, there are certain technological glitches that do exist. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to, you know, arrange more sessions with Shardul and Varun, you know, uh, talking about how uh, the initiative of Smart Protein is shaping up sometime later. Uh, we'll be definitely doing that. So uh, right now, I think we are opening uh, the deck for questions. 
Please make sure that your questions are related to the topic under discussion here. That is smart proteins. I can see many people asking for the feedback link. Um, I think by the time I'm waiting for uh, questions uh, from the uh, people, we have uh, you know created uh, three poll questions. I request you all to uh, participate in that poll and answer it. So the poll is live now. Okay. So in the meantime, I think we have uh, a question from. Uh, we have a question. Just a moment from. Sakshi Zadokar, she is asking Shadul, won't alternate protein be costlier than the traditional proteins? Yeah, that's a great question, right? And very pertinent question to ask. Like we're talking about taste, price and convenience, and we're talking about making these cost competitive where we are at currently, right? So for all the reasons that I said, you know, and uh, the beginning of industry, like for example, when mobile phones came out in 1990s or any other technology that comes out, there's a curve there. The good thing is that alternative proteins as a technology is extremely scalable. Once the kind of research and you're already seeing a lot of activity happening, hundreds of companies getting launched. But since this builds on every year, we already talked about last year being the breakthrough year. But as it builds on, the prices are sharply dropping and we're seeing that, right? Uh, when uh, the cultivated burger first came out from Netherlands uh, in a lab of a professor, it was termed to be a hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of burger. But the prices have dropped for culture media, for, for growth factors by 100x, right? And similarly in plant protein, like Impossible and Beyond, which are the oldest companies in the space globally, almost uh, 11 years, 12 years old now, they have been cutting their prices very, very rapidly. And their six pack of burgers now at a Walmart and Costco, etc. they all are quite competitive, maybe at a margin of 20, 30%, but these are dropping rapidly. So it's not just about being same in price i think in future as more research happens they are actually going to drop in price and become more cross uh, price competitive okay okay thanks Shadul, for this uh taking this question we have another question for uh, from mr pradeep uh, he's asking why not focus on a single cell protein like the fungi Absolutely, we should. And we have an excellent report on fungi strategic analysis, which is why I was saying, right, which is why it's important to understand there are three key modalities of uh, the smart protein sector, right? And uh, basically, all of them are very, very important. When people ask me which is more important, there's no specific answer because they're all going to have a market share later on because algae, uh, in case of plants, uh, fungi are excellent microbial sources to get protein at a very cheap and at a fraction of price compared because you don't have supply chains. You don't have to worry about that. You just need a uh, setup and then basically you're producing these proteins from microbes, right? So it's definitely an exciting area of application. I'll recommend um, the person who asked this question to check out a fungi strategic analysis analysis report and our algal fungal uh, algal strategic analysis report as well for more details on all the value chain we interviewed a bunch of stakeholders from industry from other key strategic um, government departments etc as well to uh, you know for your knowledge uh, the third question is from Mr. Dhanesh Algarasamy. He's asking if I have an idea for a startup in cultivated meat what should be my first step Right, quite exciting. The first step at this point should be to sign up for the challenge, right? Because we are curating this entire five-month journey just for entrepreneurs like you, so that you get all the fundamental knowledge of the sector, and then you get 201 level knowledge, 301 level complex knowledge across the phases as you go through the journey. We'll help you, you know, create your business plan through the templates we provide, through the mentorship we provide, with all of these partners and incubators and mentors. So anybody who's currently thinking or maybe has started a company in the past one year, two year, three years, they should should all think about applying to the India Smart Protein Innovation Challenge because this gives them a structured path, right? And after speaking with all of these hundreds of participants that I mentored last year, it was very, very clear that none of this information is readily available anywhere else. And we are able to make this all available for free through a non-for-profit initiative because of our donors, sponsors on the challenge and other key partners. So really excited to have all of the entrepreneurs and researchers and students alike uh, and even corporate professionals, entrepreneurs who are looking at this and thinking, okay, maybe I might start a company a couple of years down the line, right? This is an excellent platform for you to begin your journey. So do sign up, only 15 days left. So 10th of September is the deadline. Okay, so the last question for today, I mean, we still have a lot of questions, but you know, we are really pushing in uh, with the time. The last question that we're going to take today is from Dr. S. Gupta. Um, the question is, can smart protein innovation be used to develop fermented uh, fermented products? Uh, 
uh, in the ready to eat processed foods for weaning child yeah no definitely so nutrition is a key important piece here and as we are talking about getting more crops which are protein rich they'll emerge a combination so it's never uh, most of the entrepreneurs get this thing wrong they focus on one specific crop it's never about that because you know you're looking to replicate so many different functionalities it's a blend of different protein and blend of different protein sources right which will have a synergy in terms of nutrition and uh, that is a great area of development as well uh, we are specifically focused on meat eggs and dairy products and making alternatives for that uh, but there are a lot of separate categories emerging along with this right high vegetarian protein category where people don't necessarily care about the taste of the end product right their more focus is on nutrition but that is a very small segment in fact 71% of indians are self reported non vegetarians which is often a big area of confusion for many people who think that these products are for vegans or vegetarians or the growth in veganism or vegetarianism is growing the demand of this sector not really because uh, the thing is that growth will happen and for a country like india anything in food processing whether it's jam jellies to all the way to you know smart uh at times you know we do feel uh, that the importance of the food industry is not that much because you know we take food for granted but even honestly speaking you know you cannot live a day without food so anything that happens in food you know uh, we have to be really serious about so uh, thanks again charlo and uh, varun you know to agree agreeing to be a part of this very wonderful uh, webinar and it's one of the most uh, you know thought provoking webinar we've had uh, under this azadi ka amrit mahotsav a theme which we are running uh, under fixi so uh, thanks so much and uh, my heartiest thanks on behalf of our organization and all the participants here now for the participants um, as i said at the starting of the session uh, now is the time where you are supposed to uh you know send us across your email ids for all the people who have already shared please do not share it again all right so all the people who have not shared their email ids till now please put it in the chat box share your email ids and you will be uh, privy to uh, getting the certificate of participation only when you submit the feedback form okay so on your email ids that you uh, type in in the chat box here we are going to send you a uh, feedback on that link and submit your feedback once we have your feedback we will be making the certificates and dispatching it to you on your registered email ids i think uh, that's all for today thanks everyone for uh, you know uh, being a part of uh, this knowledge sharing session uh, i hope that you have a good week ahead thanks so much uh, we are signing off from fixi thanks again shardul thanks again varun hope thank to connect further thanks yeah. fixi for thanks. everything you're doing take care everyone thank you <laughs> thanks so much everyone bye bye